Thank you very much. It's great to be here in San Diego again, uh, talking about uh, the passion I have in AR and VR, and about global health and education. It's always a pleasure to be here, of course. I'm talking a little bit about my work in the last few years, and the title is Redefining Human Interaction, and how we're changing the whole concept of the doctor-patient relationship, but also the doctor-student relationship, the doctor-trainee relationship, and about how we can redefine that kind of interaction going forward. Every Tuesday morning, I go to my clinic. I'm a cancer specialist. I see seven to ten patients a day breaking bad news, sometimes good news, sometimes palliation. I see the patients after I hold their hand, I look at their eyes, I talk, I try to empathize. It reminds me of that picture on the right, on left-hand side from about two or three thousand years ago, the way we've defined human interaction in that kind of relationship. It's what we aspire to. I remember giving the oath, the Hippocratic oath, uh, back in 1993 when I qualified. I know what you're thinking, you look too young to have qualified such a time ago. <laughs> However, it was really a question of how we redefine ourselves given that oath. What I like to do, of course, this is a tech conference, it's a health conference. It's not just about physicians, it's about venture capitalists, it's about tech people, entrepreneurs. So I want you all to stand up for me. Could you do that for me? All of you stand up together. And we're going to do this together, because I think it's really important. The Hippocratic Oath changed the Declaration of Geneva after the trauma of the Second World War. I think together we need to reshape the future of healthcare. So let's go through it together really quickly. One, two, three. I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the service of humanity. The health and well-being of my patient will be my first consideration. I respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for, my, for human life. I will not permit considerations of age, disease or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will respect the secrets that are confided in me, even after the patient has died. I will practice my profession with conscience, dignity, and in accordance with good medical practice. I will foster the honor and noble traditions of the medical profession. I will give to my teachers, colleagues, and students respect and gratitude that is their due. I will share my medical knowledge for the benefit of the patient and the advancement of health care. I will attend to my own health, well-being and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties even under threat. I make these promises solemnly, freely, upon my honour. Take a seat. We have to share this because I think it's so important. We forget what we're doing is shaping humankind health care and we all are on a common purpose in mankind. The one word missing from that oath was the word technology which is interesting, because actually technology, we can still enable these oaths and pledges to our patients going forward. So that's the kind of thing I'm going to talk going forward. To exponential medicine, this is the Daniel Craft 1924, okay? Think exponentially, all right? Thinking about how we're going to redesign healthcare and interaction. The radio doctor they called it back in 24. This diagnosis by telemedicine, way before any of us were thinking about this. This is exponential medicine, of course. We need to create a different kind of being. We need to create healthcare professionals in the future who are able, who are flexible, who are going to be entrepreneurs, who are going to redesign healthcare, improve patient outcomes. So we've created the world's first program embedded into a curriculum at my medical school. We've been around a thousand years. Daniel Craft's part of the faculty, giving us free time. Teach our students around entrepreneurship, around capitalist funding, in terms of the uh, um, doing ideas to generate ideas, apps to design, coders, UI, UX teams, all teaching together in this environment. That's a world-class team talking to my students. They go off creating ideas. They have mentorship. In the end, they go to a hackathon and a pitch. It's completely changed where medicine should be taught because our new millennial doctors are thinking about the future. We need to create that kind of environment. Dan has been great in supporting that. We talk about the fourth industrial revolution, all these technologies coming together. And medicine, this is the best time to be in medicine ever with so many things going on together, impacting patient care, improving outcomes. And so I sort of think about the world being connected. My world, I do a lot of global health work, and my story is around how we raise up uh, the, the profile of education around the world and uh, clinical practice. The big companies like Google putting clouds, sort of balloons into the cloud, giving Wi-Fi activity, Wi-Fi speed access. And also we have um, Facebook putting drones into the air, again giving this world connectivity that we so lust after. We, we have an insatiable appetite for connections. Only recently, Project Maria, they laid a cable from North America to, to, to Europe to allow us to do AI and VR and AR, and that's the kind of thing we need to think about. Even our own organization, NHS, which is steeped in tradition, is getting on the act, right? They're going to connect people because it empowers people, empowers patients, and empowers our students. 
My own view around global health, we have a huge problem with surgery, we have a deficit, two-thirds population, don't have access to safe and affordable surgery, we need to train too many more surgeons, we need to perform 150 million operations per year to make healthcare just fair. And we want that kind of thing, we will aspire to improving health, health outcomes around the world. So my story is around one to many. Forget one to two, one to one, think about one to many. How do you share knowledge with many people? We all have an aspiration to share our knowledge with many people as possible. So back in 2014, I used Google Glass to live stream an operation across the globe. On that day, I taught, oh, where's it going? Oops, sorry. Okay. I taught 14,000 people using smart technology around the globe in 118 countries just by streaming an operation through wearable tech. The communication was about text messages on my glass. Going forward a couple of years, let's fast forward, we're at virtual reality. I did the world's first VR operation back in um, last year, where I invited the world to the operating theater using the first set of GoPro rigs. That operation was carried out on a worldwide basis. People in 142 countries watched the operation, 55,000 live viewers. This 360 camera rig allows immersion. People around the world using a low cost technology, a simple VR headset, to actually immerse themselves in operating theatre around the world. It's low cost, it's high tech. Our team have now created the world's first interactive VR training platform to take the whole kind of learning into its natural continuum through AR and VR. And you can download this if you want to on all the systems. This way of engaging on a learning platform that's validated, uh, learning about operations, about the kind of content we've taken for granted for in e-learning platforms before. And we can access operations, we can figure out how this whole the team structure works in theater. The situated in the right upper quadrant a gallstone may get impacted in the neck of the gallbladder, called the Hartman's pouch. It's intuitive. Young children work this on already in Japan and China. They're using VR already in their, in their kind of learning experiences. Clip a flyer, please. Now, as you can see, it's a very short cystic duct. So. so feel free to play around with that. The other thing I think about is the interaction is social media. The internet is defined as social media. Social media is the internet. The two are sort of really now well combined. You're all on your Facebook at the moment, on taking pictures, on Twitter, whatever it is. And I think these are really powerful devices. Why create your own platforms? You've got free platforms that reach, in Facebook's account, 2.2 billion users on a daily basis, yeah? Instagram, 300 million users, Twitter, similar. And uh, Snapchat has a reach of 175 million people on free platforms that are quite sophisticated. Okay, so that's going to keep in place. So this is me in Bangladesh, the quickest country in the world to one million Facebook users. They live, breathe Facebook, right? So I did a Facebook live operation from Bangladesh within the country, 10,000 surges immediately, suddenly logged on. It's the way they understand, it's the way we're learning. We can't learn from like the way we've learned before, we have to adapt our way of thinking. Snapchat, and it wouldn't be fair without I didn't put my Snapchat glasses on, of course. I'm known as a Snapchat surgeon, so I'll put that on just for, there we are. So. Now, what we did with Snapchat, it's, if you think about the age group, 75% of the users are between the ages of 17 and 25. That's the age of my students and my trainees. So I thought, can I use spectacles to record an operation in 10-second clips, put it out on my story, and redesign the way we, we teach? So we did it. We to the hospital. We'll be doing an ingle hernia repair in about half an hour or so, using the spectacles and live onto my story. So this is the anatomy, anterior superior spine, symphysis pubis, pubic tubercle, and the inguinal canal. It went viral, okay? The Time Magazine editor came in and said, I really want your story. We're sharing kind of new way of teaching and training using social media. Let's get a story out there. I've been lucky to be in a lot of newspapers and TV around the world, but you know the most disruptive thing of all I've ever done is actually be on Cosmopolitan. Can you imagine my story on Cosmo? That's disruption at its finest, if I think of it earlier. My kids don't think I'm particularly cool. I'm a colorectal surgeon. I deal with people's cancer and bottoms. But for one day last year, they felt I was really cool because Ashton Kutcher put me on his Facebook page, all right? Suddenly, their daddy was super cool. <laughs> but actually, what it was, it's that operation, simple hernia operation, nothing complex, no robotics, had two million views. It had over 200,000 downloads on YouTube. And every time I operate now, I have 5,000 students already around the world just communicating with me on a real-time basis. 
We did some analytics on that, and the analytics um, looking at how many people retweeted or tweeted that operation within a month, it was 56 million people. Just on a simple operation using simple smart te technology. Incredible reach. Basically, hey, it's free. That's the kind of world we live in, right? So the other day, I reached out to my students and said, where are you watching it from? You're on Snapchat. Who are you? What's your name? Where are you? A girl called Ella responded. Hi, sir, I'm Ella. I'm from the Marianas Islands. I'm watching you. I'm, I'm being taught by you. I'm a third-year medical student. So I Googled it. Where the hell is Marianas Islands? I saw this big blue picture. And I kept zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. I finally found the island of 12,500 people. And I was communicating with her, teaching her on Snapchat. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that where you reach people by using these kind of platforms going forward? There we are, that's the island. I must go and visit one day and see Ella, right? But of course, it's really a love fest for Daniel Kraft. So that's what Snapchat's been designed for, and he's my brother, right? That's what we do, right? What about Twitter? So I was lucky enough to be the curator of the whole entire NHS account for a whole week. It was me, I controlled it, I sent stories about my life, etc. You know what we did? We did the world's first live operation on Twitter. How can I teach the public using language they understand? So this is what we did. A million people engaged with that kind of environment. It's a way of teaching the people about the whole theater structure, the safety mechanisms, the team involved in the operation taking place. And I'll forward it because you can watch it on an HS site going forward. What about remoteness. Why do we have to be there? This is me doing my uh, theatre list remotely, walking into theatres, seeing patients remotely, connecting in different ways, using wearable technology, using telepresence systems, beams. It's funny, after one or two minutes, people think it's normal. What about that? So we talked a little about telemedicine being remote, right? We talked about virtual reality bringing people towards you. What about transporting yourself, the ultimate ambition for all of us, like in the film Star Trek, of course. So, this is, the, this is my own selfie. I know, it's, they, they've, they've struggled to find my best side, I tell you, right? 104 cameras. And I created a volumetric uh, virtual surgeon, like uh, Shafi Ahmed, uh, using photogametry and volumetric. And that's me, the world's first virtual surgeon. I know, not much to look at, I understand. The material wasn't great to work with. However, imagine that person having AI interface the back end. It talks just like Avatar film, right? That could teach millions of people together, have the entire knowledge of the internet behind him, right? Isn't that the way we empower people going forward? So actually, I thought one step further. I'm often called the Tony Stark of surgery because I like my gadgets and things. But actually, I thought, what about doing the ultimate ambition? What about adding holograms, avatars, Surgeons being remote, connected in that space. I met a guy, a company called Atheo, uh, and we're going to show that in a second. But I want, first of all, for Daniel to come through to showcase something very quickly before I share the video. You ready? Okay. Oh, we'll carry on. We'll show the video. We'll come back to that in one moment. So, we have now entered the virtual space with my colleagues from around the world to discuss a case uh, which is going on behind me in theatres, get some real time advice about the case. So um, we'd like to uh, introduce you to the people from around the world. So in front of me, um, tell me about yourself and who are you, where are you watching from? Hey, this is Ian. Uh, I'm here in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. I'm one of the creators of Thrive. Pleasure to be here today. Thank you for joining us from the US. Um, Shailash. Hi, this is Professor Shailesh Srikande. I'm the chief of GI and HPV cancer surgery at the Tatum Memorial in Mumbai, in India. Thank you very much for joining us on this special occasion. And Hitesh Patel. Hi, I'm Hitesh Patel. I'm a consultant colorectal surgeon, and I'm joining you from the London Independent Hospital. So we have four people in four different places across three continents trying to connect together to discuss a case in real time. This is going to change the way we sort of manage our patients and also how we train and teach in the future. So first of all, uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm just going to go to the, um, the patient's record. I'm just going to just open up the file. And we'll see. Uh, I'll give you a quick discussion. This is a patient who is just over 80 years of age who presented with anemia and was found to have a lesion uh, in the sort of right colon, on colonoscopy. That's a pelvic model. We're going to get the scans all out here, and then we're just going to just move up to the next scan here, and also the endoscopy report. So, um, Professor Shailash, would you mind just 
talk to me about the case and what your thoughts are about how we should manage this patient. A lesion in the right colon, if I see the CT scan image, but of course I also see the... So you get the idea. So we can I just pause it for that point for a moment while hopefully Daniel and Shona can connect with Ian and perhaps we can ask that for one side. Off you go. Do you want to change right. the... Uh... I see Shauna there. I see Ian who's yeah. in Atlanta. I can see the Oops. files. Hi, Ian. Hey, how's it going, guys? Great. I might pull down a patient file. Is that okay? Sure. Go for it. Oh, I see some beautiful art. Maybe I want the patient. I can see the current history, and I can pull in the pelvic model. Perfect. Where'd it go? Is it here somewhere? Shauna, what do you see? I've got it right here. I see you. And I see... Yeah. Tira, Tira, right, I think. Our friends in Atlanta. Oh, wow. <laughs> cool. So, uh, actually, if I can touch base with this, we have a pelvic model oh, in front of us here. And what's really cool of Thrive is, uh, because we're all here in physical space, just like you would be in the real world, we're able to actually indulge and look at this content in its full three-dimensional form because, after all, the human body is volumetric in nature. So whether we're discussing a patient or might be going through a medical training procedure, being able to actually experience that content in full 3D as well as have this physical relationship from one another is a really important building block in cementing that knowledge in your mind. And even though I'm 2,000 miles away here in Atlanta, we're sharing this conversation face-to-face -face here on the stage live. Okay, I'm ready to operate. That's still the pelvis, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Virtual scrubs. So now we can interact. So we, can, we can even show us a walk through the surgery by step by step. Exactly. So with Thrive, we make it very easy, again, to come face to face, upload content. So whether that's a 3D model in this case or image, PDF, etc. And so actually, if I draw your attention to this, uh, see that's the left hip bone. I can make a quick annotation to try to highlight uh, whatever it is we might be discussing. So again, we come together in this physical space, face to face, with that content and that color experience here in mixed reality. Incredible. So this is the future of collaboration, not just for surgery, but almost any form of uh, collaboration between clinicians, patients, engineers, technologists. Maybe you can do our future exponential medicine conference in a virtual space. Yeah? When exactly, when we're because we're building about, a. Go ahead, guys. I was, one of the things we were talking about that maybe this family could actually be watching. So this is how we're including people outside of the experience. Exactly. You picture a patient's family coming into a medical office to have a sit down with the doctor to discuss on a physical model how a procedure might go, and he might use his pen to show where a surgery might occur. But with this technology, we can bring those people together face to face anywhere on earth but ultimately have a much richer understanding, whether it is the doctor, the patient, their family, friends, et cetera, of what exactly is about to occur. Yeah. Okay. A little bit too you. close. <laughs> okay. Can we just go back to my other, to the other, the last slide set, please? My slides, thank you. If we can go back to that. Anyway, the last thing to say was really about my last slide, which was about my patients. We started off with a patient journey about the human touch the interaction between the doctor and the patient. And actually, all the work that I do for innovation, these kind of talks are really down to them. They take most risks on my behalf. So I dedicate my talk and the work that I do always to my patients who really should be at the forefront, all our minds, the work that we do. Thank you very much for listening.